So in this video, we'll talk about two things. One is how do we measure attitudes, something we care quite a bit about as marketers. And the second is how do we measure willingness to pay? Although we'll do that relatively quickly as that is a topic on its own covered in other courses here at Tupper. So attitudes are mental states that have strong influence on behavior. There's quite a bit of research that looks at whether an attitude, something like how much you like a product or how likely you are to buy that product actually influences purchase behavior. And the answer is it influences it quite a bit. It's not very surprising. If you're someone who says you're more likely to purchase something, of course you're more likely to buy it than someone who says they're not likely to buy it. Now, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one relationship and we'll talk about that later on, but it is indicative of whether someone is more or less likely to buy as an example. There are quite a few different ways for us to measure people's attitudes, but four that I'll talk about and four that are very common are Likert scales, semantic differential scales, constant sum scales, and purchase intention scales. But before I do that, I need to make it very, very clear that when you're designing a survey, the way that you should be thinking about this is that no one, not a single person other than you, cares about your stupid survey. And I say that with all the sincerity that I possibly can. When people are taking surveys, they want to get through them as quickly as they possibly can. They don't care about your intentions. They don't want to think about what you're trying to do. They are busy. They are distracted. They are bored. They are unmotivated and they are tired. What that means is if you want good responses, meaning responses that are reflective of people's actual attitudes and beliefs, you have to be incredibly thoughtful about how you write the specific words and what specific questions you choose to ask. If you ignore that and you disrespect your respondents by having things like typos, having things like inconsistent phrasings, or having confusing questions, which we'll all talk about in a moment, that will lead your participants to stop paying attention and start circling fours down the page. That is a terrible outcome for you. So I will repeat this again in a future video because it is worth saying more than once. No one cares about your stupid survey. And again, I don't mean to say that your survey is actually stupid, but from the perspective of the respondent, they just don't care. And if you can have that attitude when you're designing surveys, you're much more likely to get valid and good responses that will inform decision-making as opposed to just garbage where people are circling at random. Having said that, let's talk about Likert scales. So Likert scales, we've already seen a version of this, but they're very typically described as things like favorable or unfavorable on some dimension. You can compute them and maybe sum across a series of items, and I'll show you that in a second. And the scores are interpreted as comparisons against something else. That's critical, and we'll see that as well in just a moment. So here's a little bit of a wordy but pretty standard type of scale asking people about their attitudes towards something like Giant Eagle, which is a local grocery store here in Pittsburgh. And it asks it on six different dimensions where people can respond across five options ranging from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And so this might seem simple, but mechanically, let's go through what this might look like. You hand someone a questionnaire, maybe at the grocery store, and they fill this out, and you get it back, and you have to do something with it. And one of the simplest things you actually have to do is convert those check marks or those ticks into numbers. And the scale you use is pretty much arbitrary, but use something that makes sense. In this case, I'm gonna use one, two, three, four, five. If you wanted to use negative two through positive two, that'd be fine too. It doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, we're only gonna be using this for comparative purposes and you'll see why in a moment. So you do that and you get all your numbers. And one thing that you might want to do is then say, well, what's the overall attitude this person has towards this giant eagle grocery store? So you might just sum that up. Though I hope some of you right away, if you're paying attention, see something is going on here that might cause us a problem. In particular, three of those options are intentionally written with a reverse implication, meaning the higher the response, the less favorable is someone's attitude towards Giant Eagle. So that first one, lines in the store's checkout move slowly. If someone says a five, that's a negative attitude. If someone says a one, that's a very positive attitude. So nominally, we have to do what's called reverse coding those if we're trying to sum up this scale into a single attitude. And to reverse code them is a very simple calculation. We say, how many numbers do we have? We have five. We add one, that's six, and then we subtract the number from that. And what that will do is if you have a five, well, six minus five is a one, so it flips it to the other side. If you have a two, well, six minus two is four, which flips that over to the other side. And of course, if you have a three, six minus three is three. So to reverse code those, we simply run them through that calculation and we get these values. We can then sum those values up and that number 24 is a correct representation of the total attitude that someone has. Now, of course, we could also compute an average across those six items. It's the same thing, we're just divided by six or not. And then you might wanna ask yourself, well, what do I do with that? Do I celebrate that my store has a 24 response? No, 24 means nothing in the absolute. 
it is only useful when compared to something else. So for example, let's say 24 is the average across a bunch of people. Well, we can compare those responses to last quarter's responses. And let's say the average attitude of people was a 22 previously, and we could run a statistical test to compare 22 to 24. We'll cover that in a future video. And let's say those are different. Well, that's great. Then we can celebrate. It seems like attitudes have improved. As another example, we can compare across different stores. Let's say one of my grocery stores has an average of 27, and another one has an average of 24. Well, we might want to investigate why that 27 is doing so well, and can we take what they're doing so well and implement it somewhere else in that 24 store? Or we can compare different groups of people. Let's say we've got shoppers that come during the day or shoppers that come during nighttime. Do they have different levels of satisfaction? We can see. We can make that type of a comparison. We can even compare across questions. So we can compute averages per question and see if there's dimensions that are more or less favorable, and that would be fine as well. The key here is it's a comparison. Those values in absolute mean basically nothing. They're only useful when we make a comparison across something like time or groups or places or anything else that might be relevant to your specific business question. Now, I know I said that those numbers are arbitrary, but that's because I put those on after the fact. Numbers themselves, when they're placed on a scale, are not arbitrary. So for example, if I have a question like, overall, how successful would you say you've been in your life? I know it's a weird question, but imagine it's asked on this, what's known as a staple scale, going from negative four, not at all successful, to positive four, extremely successful. Well, it turns out this was done. And in a particular study, what they found was that 17% of respondents indicated one of those first five options. Now, they had another group of individuals who answered the same question, but they changed the numbers slightly. They made the numbers go from zero to eight. Now, what's worth noting is that everything is exactly the same here, right? The numbers don't mean anything. They're just a way for us to map what's in our heads to the piece of paper. So we really should see the same basic set of results, but not, that's not what you see. Instead, for those same first five options, you find that 44% of people are willing to endorse those particular choices. And the reason is when people see a negative response option, as opposed to, let's say, a zero, like in the bottom case, they interpret a negative connotation to that. So if you ask me how successful my life is, I might say, eh, it's okay. And I might want to say it's something like a two. I don't want to say it's negative because who wants to say I have a negative success in life? And so when you have this negative four to four, people tend to treat that almost like two separate scales. They first answer the question, is my life successful, yes or no? If they say no, then they use the left half of the scale. And if they say yes, they use the right half of the scale. And then they make a judgment about how successful or unsuccessful it is within those two subscales. So when you're using negative to positive options, just be very sensitive to this. It might be the case that you're actually creating two scales instead of one like we have on the bottom. And people will treat those differently. And because of that, you need to be sensitive to it when you're designing and writing your survey questions. Another classic example of a scale is a constant sum scale. So you might see something like, here's 100 points and allocate them to indicate how important they are in determining what health plan you use when selecting your health insurance provider. And you have things like ability to choose a doctor, extent of coverage provided, and so on. And what people do is they take 100 points and they divide them amongst this, and in principle, this is a beautiful scale. It allows you to do both what an ordinal scale allows you to do, which is say which is more important than which, but it also lets you say how much more something is important to something else. So for example, I might say the ability to choose a doctor is 50, then the extent of coverage is a 30, and the quality of medical care is a 20, and then zeros for the others. So I've now indicated to you ties, which I couldn't do in a typical ordinal scale context. I indicated to you which one is more important which, than others, and I indicated the degree of difference. That sounds great. The problem, however, is that these scales are insanely difficult for people to actually do. First, the order in which those options are displayed matters quite a bit. If you notice, I started at the top and I gave that option a bunch of points. Remember that first point, people are lazy. If I ask people to do this, they're not gonna update their response all that much. So they'll say that 50 initially, and now they're left with 50 points. So whatever that first option happens to be tends to dominate the response set. Even if you do something that's good, like randomizing the order of responses, you're still stuck with people indicating the highest value very often for the first response option. Beyond that, people stink at math. They're gonna give you responses that don't sum to 100. Now, you can solve this in a computerized survey, of course, where it automatically checks that, but think about what's gonna happen. People are gonna say 50, and they're gonna say 30, and they're gonna say 10, and they're gonna say, I don't know, whatever, whatever's left, that's what I'm gonna put on the last one. But that's not a true reflection of preference. That's not a true attitudinal response. That's just them getting lazy. And so when you have people getting lazy and complex questions like this, you get garbage data. So as much as these in theory provide very useful data and information, and so in practice, I find that these actually don't work all that well at all. You more or less get a lot of garbage and you'd be much better off just having a bunch of interval scales where you ask people how important each of these options are. Now, in doing so, you're gonna lose the ordinality because people can rate things the same, but that might be their honest opinion. 
it might be the case that all of these are really important to them. And if that's the case, you need to be able to capture that. And you can do that with interval scales just fine without having to invoke something as complex as this one. Another incredibly common scale is the purchase intention scale. It's a scale that might look something like this based on the product descriptions. And so hopefully you get some good quality product descriptions and maybe an image or something like that. How likely would you be to buy this product if it were available at the store in your area? Definitely would buy, probably would buy, might not buy, probably would not buy, definitely would not buy. This question has been used so many times in so many different contexts that it's actually very well calibrated to understand how it translates into actual purchase behavior. What do I mean by that? Well, we know kind of just based on doing this a lot that folks who say definitely would buy, about 80% of them actually would buy. In other words, 20% of them say they would, but you know, they're just BSing us. We also know that of the people who say probably would buy, about 30% of them will actually buy. And we know that anybody who responds basically in any other way is unlikely to buy at all. And what this lets you do is figure out market size. So let's say we have 100 people, 10 of them say that they definitely would buy, 10 of them would say they probably would buy, and 80 of them say something else down below. Well, I can estimate market size. If 10 of them said that they definitely would buy, 80% of that is eight. If I have 10 who'd say it probably would buy, 30% of that is three. Everybody else is a zero. We had eight plus three is 11. And so we estimate that about 11% of customers, given our market potential, would actually be interested in purchasing this. I would then figure out what the total market potential is. So let's say there's 100 million customers out there. I would say that we expect about 11% of those 100 million people to actually transact and purchase this product if it is provided to them in the way that we described in this survey. It's a very useful and very straightforward way to estimate market sizes. And that's powerful with a simple question like this. And so now we'll pivot quickly to measuring willingness to pay. And the reason I do this quickly is because other courses of Tepper, like New Product Design, actually capture this quite well. So here's an example of a question that might measure willingness to pay. How much would you be willing to pay for a 16 ounce bottle of Dove Exuberance Shampoo? Now the challenge with this question is if you're me and you ask me this question, I have no idea. I mean, I don't know, $50, $100, what's the right answer? I, I mean, I'm joking, of course, but I don't know because I'm not a customer of this particular product category. I buy the same shampoo on Amazon, auto repurchase. It just comes to my door. I don't think about it. I don't even know what I spend on it. It just appears. So if you ask me and I'm ill-informed, I'm just gonna give you a random answer and that's a problem. And so when you're asking these open-ended willingness to pay questions, you need to be highly sensitive to the level of information that individuals have when they respond. If they're highly knowledgeable in a product category, fine, they'll probably give you a reasonable answer. If they're ignorant like me in this product category, they're gonna give you crazy answers. So you just have to be very mindful when you ask about willingness to pay in an open-ended way like this. Well, so we could do this differently. We could say, how much would you be willing to pay for a 16 ounce bottle of Dove Exuberance shampoo? And you give people a bunch of options. These are called bucket choices. So zero to 199, two to 299, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to nine to 999. Now, you're gonna eliminate folks like me saying 50 bucks, because that's an insane answer. But now what's gonna happen is, again, I'm ignorant, I have no idea, so I pick the middle option. I say, I don't know, about five bucks. Why? Because people tend to respond in the middle of a scale when they don't know any better. They treat the scale as information, and they say, well, I'm kind of an average person, so I'm gonna pick something in the middle. So if that scale was zero to $20, I'd say, I don't know, I'd be willing to pay $10. Does it actually reflect what I'd be willing to pay if I were to store and I saw shampoo for $10 on the shelf next to all the other shampoos? No, no it doesn't. It just reflects the fact that I had no idea and I picked a middle option because it was easy. So again, even this becomes a problem. Now that's not to say that you can't use these techniques. You just have to be highly sensitive to the fact that when you ask people their willingness to pay, more often than not, they just don't know. So another technique that we will completely gloss over here because again, it's covered well in another course is this task of conjoint analysis. The short version is you make pairwise comparisons between specific characteristics describing a product among them is price. And if done well, you can actually elicit people's willingness to pay given a set of pricing and product attribute options. That's really all I'm gonna say on this. If it's something that's really interesting to you, let's bring it up live in class and I'll dig into it, of course, as necessary. But the bottom line is willingness to pay is actually incredibly difficult to capture. One of the best ways to capture willingness to pay is with an experiment. Change price and see how demand changes. But that's really costly, really time consuming and really difficult. So we do need ways through surveys and through actual self-response to actually elicit willingness to pay, just again, be mindful that this is a very difficult task. So that actually wraps it up on how to ask specific questions. And in the next video, we'll focus on how to structure a survey and what considerations to put into doing that.